أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لحظة وما كنا لنحتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على خير الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيد الأولين والآخرين شفيع المضنبين رحمة للعالمين وحبيب إله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأحده الذي سمع في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق ولستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن الليل فتحجد به نافلة لك أسى أن يبأثك ربك مقاما محمودا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على Amongst those things which break the fast of a person fasting is staying in Janaba or in um, Hayd or in Nifas until the time of Salatul Fajr. That if someone is in the state of Janaba or if a woman has not performed ghusl for Hayd or for Nifas and they have postponed that until the time of Salatul Fajr, their fast is invalid. And amongst this hukam comes very many different other rulings which are extremely important and which are often sometimes confusing. So we just want to make that clear today. Firstly, that if someone, for example, is in the state of Janaba or in Hayd or in Nifas and they go to sleep that night and they state that, you know, if we wake up for Salat al-Fajr, if we wake up before Salat al-Fajr so we can perform ghusl, good for us. And if they don't, and, 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 and you know some people they say, if we don't, no problem, then if they wake up after the time of Salat al-Fajr, then upon them their fast is invalid, they must perform that fast in qada, and there's a kafara that is involved in that as well. Secondly, there might be, for example, a person who goes to sleep, he's in Janaba, he goes to sleep and he say, and, and you know, he has a sincere intention that he wants to wake up in the morning before Salat al-Fajr to perform ghusl. There's one of two different scenarios here. The first of these scenarios is, for example, that if someone is a very heavy sleeper, he is a sincere person, he wants to wake up for Fajr prayers, he wants to wake up before Fajr so he can perform his ghusl, but he's a heavy sleeper, he knows that it's very difficult for someone to wake him up, he sleeps that night in the state of Janaba, and he wakes up after the time, after the Adhan of Fajr. For this individual person, his fast is invalid. His fast is invalid, and he must make it up as Qada. Why? Because though he had a sincere intention to wake up and perform ghusl, he knows that it's very difficult for him to wake up. Thus, he must make sure that he performs ghusl before he sleeps. And the second one of these possibilities is, for example, if there's another person very sincere, he's in the state of Janaba, he goes to sleep that night, he keeps his alarm, for example, at three o'clock. He says, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to perform ghusl, I'm going to eat, pray fajr prayers, and go back to sleep. That particular night, for whatever reason, he didn't wake up. He overslept his alarm, and he wakes up at the Adhan of fajr prayers. His fast is valid and he, there is no need for him to make up any kafara or any qada. He just simply wakes up, performs ghusl, and he can continue the fast like everyone else. Why? Because he knows himself that he definitely always certainly wakes up when his alarm comes on and he w- would have woken up if, you know, any, if, if, if the day was like any other day. But in this particular circumstance, he did not wake up. Thus, he can just wake up, perform the ghusl, and move on with his fast. Next, there might be an individual, for example, 
that he goes to sleep in the state of Janaba or at Hayd or in Nafas, these things are all um, relative. And, and, and just to clarify something very clearly, when I speak about when a woman is in Hayd or in Nafas, it means after their blood has completed, after that time period has finished, when it's wajib upon them to perform ghusl. Of course, not every single day during their cycle, so on and so forth. So if someone goes to sleep that night with the intention that they're going to wake up to perform ghusl, they go to sleep that night at, let's say, 12 o'clock. They wake up at 2 o'clock. And they state, look, I still have two hours left, you know, let me sleep one more hour and then wake up. They put on their snooze button and they don't wake up until the Fajr prayers. For this person, because they woke up and they had the chance to perform Salatul, uh, uh, you know, the ghusl of Janaba, for this particular person, their fast is invalid. Their fast is invalid because they had the ability to wake up, but they chose not to. His fast is invalid, he must make up the qada, but there is no kafara upon him. But if there is an individual, he keeps his alarm at 2 o'clock, he says, I want to wake up, perform the ghusl. He goes to sleep, he wakes up at 2 o'clock, he says, it's only 2 o'clock, let me wake up at 3 o'clock. He keeps his alarm for 3 o'clock, he wakes up at 3 o'clock, he says, ah, 3 o'clock, let me wait half an hour. He waits half an hour, or he keeps his alarm for 3.30, and he ends up waking after the Adhan of Salat al-Fajr. The ruling is that his fast is invalid, he must make up the qada, and he must pay the kafar. Why? Because he did not wake up one time, he woke up two times. He had the ability to make ghusl, not only the first time, but the second time, he postponed that, he missed his, um, you know, he missed the Adhan of Salat al-Fajr, he woke up after that, Thus, for this specific person, he must pay the kafara and make up a qadha fast. And if, inshallah, there's any questions, we'll clarify things tomorrow. Obviously, this is very difficult, but it's very important that we understand the ahkam of our religion, especially in regards to the holy month of Ramadan. And let me just clarify one other thing, one question that often comes up. That is that if someone sleeps after Fajr prayer, let's say I come home from work today, I go to sleep, I wake up in the state of Janaba, is my fast valid? Yes, no problem. The problem is if you remain in the state of Janaba from the night time until the Adhan of Salat al-Fajr. But if someone goes to sleep, they wake up in the state of Janaba, there is no harm in that. And of course, there is no shame in religion to discuss these matters either. As the tradition states, لا حياف الدين, there is no shame. In our religion. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma sallu ala. The human being is in a state of seeking love. If you go and you study and identify any particular community or any particular culture, you'll find that the most popular thing to discuss about is about love. That when someone is young, you always ask them, when are you going to get married, for example. That in literature, in movies, in the arts, you always find this very important discussion about love in a particular society. We know that the most famous text in Western literature are the works of Shakespeare. And the most famous of Shakespearean works is Romeo and Juliet. You find that the human being loves to love and loves to be loved that within his primordial nature, the fitra, the human being aspires love in his life. Be it the love of his parents when he's young, be it the love of his spouse or her spouse when they become older, or be it loving children or vice versa when they become older. Love is a part of each and every one of our lives, no matter whether we like it or not. And you find that love has many different levels as well. First, you find love as it's at its physical level. You love to be close to someone. You love to talk to someone. You love to email. You love to text. If you, you love to call when the text message doesn't come or when the phone call doesn't come to your phone, you go crazy. The second level, of, of course, is this emotional love. Though you know someone is far from you, but you know that they have this intense love for you. And you know that that emotion is there, thus you can continue going on living your life. 
And love causes people to do the craziest of things. When someone loves, he will go to the other side of the world to go and seek his beloved. That love is nothing bad. Love is an Islamic principle as well. As long as love is channeled toward the absolute love, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're allowed to love our wife, we're allowed to love our fiancé, we're allowed to love our children, we're allowed to love our parents, we're allowed to love our friends. But that love is supposed to channel us to getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we love our, we love our spouse because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us our wife as an amana. We love our children because God instructed the love of the children. We love our parents because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us but we go ahead and you take examples of those ones who love the most. Those ones who loved with a purpose and you'll find that their love transcends any type of physical love. You go for example and you see the love of a man named Mithan al Tamar. What a man. A man whose love of Ali ibn Abi Talib والسلام, drove him insane. In fact, before we get into the story of Mithm al-Tammar, there was one say, a khatib sitting on the member, reciting a lecture on the birth of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he was there praising Ali ibn Abi Talib. And if you have ever, and of course we've all been to a gathering in which the birth of Amir al-Mu'mineen or the day of Ghadir was remembered, and when the speaker speaks about the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and speaks about the virtues and the fada'il of Amir al-Mu'mineen, it makes him go insane, his hairs rise from his hand, from his arms. This particular speaker was speaking about the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he was speaking to a congregation of Nusayris, people who believe, na'udhu billah, that Ali ibn Abi Talib is their God. He was speaking about the greatness of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and these individuals in the crowd were saying, say it, you know, just say Ali is God. He's beginning to recite the fada'il of Amir al-Mu'mineen, speaking about Ali at Badr and al-Ahad and al-Khandak and al-Khaybar. And these individuals, of course, who are doing kufr billah by saying Amir al-Mu'mineen is their Lord, the speaker waits and he says, you say is Ali is God? They say, yes, you say it too, you admit to it. He said, no. He said, how great is God if he is the Lord of Ali ibn Abi Talib? When Mitham al-Tammar is there, he is taken by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, Mitham al-Tammar was a companion of Ali ibn Abi Talib, of Hassan ibn Ali, and of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu And something people don't know is that Mitham al-Tammar was in the prison of Kufa. He was in the prisons of Kufa and was unable to go toward Karbala to fight with Imam al Hussein. He was a very old man at this particular time. Eventually, there was a breakthrough from the prison. People escaped. Mithim al-Tammar was one of them. He was brought in front of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Of course, we know the story. He was stuck and um, you know, uh, crucified on the tree. And he wouldn't die until he began to sing the praises of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He knew that Ali ibn Abi Talib had promised him that he was going to die in this particular way. Or he was going to be lynched on this particular tree. He would go to that tree and water that tree. Mitham al-Tammar would begin to sing the praises of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The historian writes that even after he had been killed, his tongue was still moving, reciting the fada'il of Amir al-Mu'mineen until they had to cut off the tongue of Mitham al-Tammar. That's true love. Muslim bin Aqil, Muslim bin Aqil leaves Imam al Hussein from Mecca or Medina. He is told to go toward Kufa. He goes toward Kufa. He reaches the house of Muhtar al-Thaqafi. When he reaches, he's crossed through the desert. He enters into the house of Muhtar. Muhtar asks him, oh, Muslim bin Aqil. He said, how did you get here? He said that the journey is really long from Mecca, from Medina, all the way to come toward Kufa. He says, didn't you have, you know, any food, any water, any help? He said, I had two guides. Both of them died from the heat. And all of the food and all of the drink from my caravan got ran out. He said, then, Oh Muslim, how did you reach Kufa? He said, my love of Abi Abdullah al Hussein allowed me to live. That's true love. On the day of Ashura, there is a companion of Imam al Hussein named Sa'id ibn Abdullah. Sa'id ibn Abdullah, 
stands in front of Abi Abdullah al Hussein when the arrows are coming at the time of Salat. If I were to come and if I were to throw something at someone, the natural reaction is that they move away. When arrows were coming to Sa'id ibn Abdullah, coming toward Aba Abdullah al Hussein, this particular companion would stand in front of the arrow and take it. He went against his own nature because love causes people to do crazy things. And when love is this intense, when love has a cause, when love leads you to understanding your Lord, you are able to do the absolute most amazing things that you realize you could have never done before. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Hadith al-Qudsi, He says that the one who claims to love me yet does not stand up in the middle of the night to perform prayers to me is a liar. That if someone is truly in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he wakes up in the middle of the night to perform salat. Which prayer is this? Amongst the most recommended actions of a believer, specifically in this holy month of Ramadan, is the performing of Salatul Layl. Salatul Layl, the night prayer. There's a tradition from our holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He states, Ashraf al-Ummati hamalat al-Qur'an wa ashab al-Layl. The most noble of my people, the most noble of my followers are the ones who protect the Qur'an, the ones who stay up in the middle of the night in recitation of the Qur'an, the ones who study the Qur'an, the ones who reflect on the Holy Qur'an, and the the ones who wake up in the middle of the night to call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In these days where we've been talking about supplication, Supplication tied to Salatul Layl allows the heart to reach the greatest of heights. One of the ulama, Muqaddis al Irdabili, he states, or, or, or they state that whenever he would come forth in the middle of the night, he would wake up from his sleep. He would go toward his, his, his fountain of water and he would call out, he would say, Oh Allah, he said, What is all of the gold in the world? in comparison with the water that someone has to perform wudu for Salatul Layl. That gold means absolutely nothing. Diamonds mean absolutely nothing. Wealth means absolutely nothing when it comes to standing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anyone, anyone has performed Salatul Layl, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And for the one who has never woken up in the middle of the night, to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and perform this prayer has absolutely no idea what the traditions of the Ahl al-Bayt refer to. You go ahead and you see the multitude of traditions of the Ahl al-Bayt in regard to the devotion, in regard to the sincerity, in regards to their a'mal when they came forth to praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam would stand up in the middle of the night the traditions state that he would stand up on his toes until his feet would become bruised, calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him the holy verses of the Holy Quran, Ya ayyuhal muzammil, qum al-layl illa qalila. Oh, the one who has shrouded himself. Muzammil means the one who would take a piece of cloth and he would wrap himself in it. Because he would be shaking in the middle of the night, this Rasulullah. And he would be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive him. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate his status. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh Rasulullah, pray less. It's okay. That for the Ahl al-Bayt, alayhi salatu was salam, that salatu lay the nawafil of our prayers were all wajib upon the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt. It stated, Zainul Abidin, who we mentioned his virtues yesterday. Zainul Abidin meaning the adornment of worshippers. That the most beautiful man ever to make ibadah, according to this title, of course, not limiting any of the other Ahl al-Bayt, was Zainul Abidin alayhi afdhul salatu was salam. You find that Imam Zainul Abidin one day is in prayers. It is stated that he was in sujood for such a long time that after he had completed his prayers, his knees were bruised. This is how long he was in sujood for. 
one of the sons of, or one of the people in the house or one of the women had come to Imam al-Sajjad after he had completed his prayer, he said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, why you pray like this? Why you pray so much? Lessen the burden. It's okay. You don't have to exert yourself so much. Imam Zainul Abidin tells this particular person in his house, he says, go there to my bookshelf and bring me the prayer manual of Ali ibn Abi Talib. It is said that they would bring, that, that that particular person brought the a'mal of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He opened it up and Imam Zainul Abidin began to cry. He says, who am I and who is Ali ibn Abi Talib? That if Imam Zain al Abidin would begin to pray until his knees would become bruised, then how great was the prayer of Ali ibn Abi Talib? It is stated one day, Amir al Mu'mineen is in the mosque. He is making his ibadah, he is praying, he's completed his prayers. The night time comes and he leaves to go to his home. On his way home, he does not actually go home, he takes a different route. One of the Onlookers are seeing Amir al-Mu'mineen and they're saying that the house of Fatima al-Zahra is this way Amir al-Mu'mineen is walking this way Where could he be going? He began to follow Amir al-Mu'mineen He found Amir al-Mu'mineen walks into the middle of a forest In between all of these trees Amir al-Mu'mineen takes out his musalla He opens it up and he begins to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In the middle of the night, under the stars He is calling out, Ya Ilahi Adum al bala Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, look at my station. Mawlai ya Mawlai, anta al-Mawlai wa ana al-Abd. He's calling out these words. It is stated that he goes into sujood. He begins to weep in his sujood until all of a sudden Amir al-Mu'mineen fell over. This particular man, he's looking at Amir al-Mu'mineen. He's saying, what happened? He goes to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He begins to wake him up. He says, inna lillahu inna ilayhi. Amir al-Mu'mineen has passed away. He doesn't know what to do. It says, he says that I ran and I sprinted to the house of Fatima al-Zahra. I knocked the door and I said, Oh Sayyidatul Nisa al-Alameen, I just saw Ali ibn Abi Talib passed out on the floor. She said, did you see his situation before? He said, yes. He was in a trance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was so convicted in his prayers with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was in sujood weeping and all of a sudden he passed out. I tried to wake him up. He wouldn't wake up. He passed away. Fatima al-Zahra said Amir al-Mu'mineen faces this particular scenario every single night in his life. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, is so intoxicated by the prayers with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so intoxicated, so infatuated with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every night he passes away, every night he passes out with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You go ahead and you see that when someone comes forth to pray Salatul Layl, his entire life can be changed. That if one person, any day in his life, decides to wake up and perform the night prayer, you see that that person will have his entire life different from the, from, from, from the, from the very next day. The tradition states, Salatul Layl, Tajlabu Rizq, Wa Salatul Layl, Tubayyidu Al-Waj, Wa Salatul Layl, Tutayyibu Rih. That if someone performs Salatul Layl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases his rizq. And if, Allah, and, and, and if someone performs Salatul Layl, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes his face bright the next day. And if someone performs Salatul Layl, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes his scent good. You find that amongst the traditions of the Ahl al-Bayt, alayhimu salatu wa salam, one of the hadiths they state, that when someone wakes up in the middle of the night, he goes and performs wudu and comes forth to his prayer mat and begins the beginning of Salatul Layl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he goes and he calls upon all of the angels in paradise. And he says, O oh angels, look at this man who left the comfort of his own bed, that beautiful sleep of his, and he withdrew himself from the entire world. And what is more important than sleep? And he comes forth to me and he begins to repent to me. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells all of the angels in paradise that for this person be witness that I have responded to everything that he has asked me. The merits of performing Salatul Layl. It is stated, there was once this great Adam, Shaykh, Ja'far Kashif al It's a great maraja from many, many decades ago. 
Every night, of course, he would be in Salatul Layl. One particular night, he woke up and he went to his son to wake him up. He woke up his son and he said, son, let's go to go and pray Salatul Layl in, in, next to the Haram of Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salatu wasalam. The son tells him, you know, I'm tired. You go ahead, I'll meet up with you. The father, he says, no. He says, no, you must wake up for Salatul Layl. You have to wake up. He says, no, really, I'm really, really tired. He says, please, wake up. He forced his son to eventually wake up. He woke up, performed wudu, they left their home. As they're walking next to, around the shrine of Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wasalam, they see one beggar. This beggar is calling out, give me money, give me wealth. The father, Shaykh Ja'far al-Kashif al ghita he turns to his son, who also turned out to be one of a leading scholars during his day. He said, what is that person over there? The son says, this is a beggar asking for money. He says, how much do you think that this beggar gets? He says, I don't know, let's say $10 a day. $10 was good enough for that person to drink, to eat, at the very least. He says, you see, what did this person have to do? The father is saying, what did this person have to do to come forth? He woke up in the middle of the night. He came to the shrine of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Then he put out his hands. He lost his sleep. He lost, you know, whatever possible benefits he could be getting from the middle of the night. And he came over here for the possibility that he could get something in the middle of the night. And he said, you wanted to remain in your sleep when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantees something when you wake up to perform Salatul Layl. That a beggar goes out in the middle of the night with the possibility of being able to eat and drink. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated that if you wake up for Salatul Layl, I'll give you everything that you could have ever asked for. Men dunya, idha aradta dunya, fasalli Salatul Layl. That if you want the dunya, then, then, then pray Salatul Layl. If you want any of the benefits of the world, pray Salatul Layl. Wa idha aradta al-akhara, fasalli Salatul Layl. And if the one who wants the afterlife, he wants paradise, he wants all of the benefits of paradise, then, then let him say, then let him pray, Salatul Layl. إِذَا أَرَدْتَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخَرَ فَعَلَيْكَ بِسَلَاتِ Layl. That if you want anything in this life, the traditions tell us, go and seek by praying Salatul Layl. For when someone comes forth to performing Salatul Layl, you find that that person understands what true love is. There is a certain anecdote in which there was once this particular town in Iran. And actually, if you go today next to the shrine of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada, alayhi salatu wa salam, in the province that surrounds this particular shrine, there is a, uh, there's a certain masjid called Masjid Goh Rashad. This particular masjid was built by the king of that time. This king, he built this particular mosque. He was a believing person, Shi'i, lover of Ahl al-Bayt, alayhi salatu was salam. States that he was there. There was once this one individual who was working to help build that center. His job was to build the center. After that, he was a sweeper in this particular mosque. Masjid Goh Rashad, it still exists till today. This particular servant, he is there every single day sweeping the mosque. One day he falls asleep in the mosque, he wakes up and he sees the most beautiful woman of the entire universe entering into this masjid. This particular daughter, this particular girl is the daughter of this king who built this particular mosque. Thus, she's the princess of this particular province. He goes and when he sees this girl, he says, wow, I have to marry her. She is so beautiful. I've never seen anything more beautiful than this particular lady, like we say about our wives, right? We've never seen anything more beautiful than you. So this particular young man, he went home that day. He went home, he was eating with his mother dinner. He's taking a little bite, he cannot eat. His mother asked him, what's wrong, son? What's going on? You don't want to eat? I made the best iftar today. Why not eating? He says, I saw this girl, she's the most beautiful girl, you know, and I want to marry her. He says, good. Who's her father? He said, her father's a mu'min man, you know. So he said, fine, let, let's go and talk to them. He said, but the problem is that she's the daughter of the king of this particular province. So the mom was like, okay, 
We're poor people. You're the sweeper in the mosque. How do you expect to get that girl? It says that for one day, two days, for a couple of weeks, he didn't eat, he couldn't drink, he was so depressed. He said, there's no way that I can marry this particular girl. His mom went to, the, w w went to her neighbor and said, you know, this is my problem. My son's not eating, he's not drinking, he doesn't want to sleep all the time. He's crying, he's lovesick, you know. What should we do? He said, go and take the, uh, you know, proposal to the king. If he rejects you, at least you know you try. It's okay, you know. Then he can move on and, you know, find someone else. The mother goes and tells the son, look, we should go and make an effort with the king. So at least you're not so depressed. You're going to die of this depression. You're going to die of this anxiety. So the, mother, so, so the son says, fine. It is said that the mother went to the kingdom that day, went in front of the king. He was a mu'min man. So he tolerated her and said, she said that, oh, you know, king, that my son works in your masjid, masjid Goh Rashad, in this particular mosque. He's a sweeper. One day he saw your daughter. He became so infatuated with her. He became so much in love with her. And he doesn't eat, he doesn't drink, and he's so sad these days. We are coming here to bring a proposal to you. If you don't accept, we understand. But if you accept, that we would be really, really happy to have her as our daughter. The king said, you know, who is this boy? They brought that boy to, to him. He's so shy, he's so sad, you know. The king says, you know, it's, it, it, it's important for me to at least ask my daughter. So the king went back. He asked the daughter, he said, you know, there's a sweeper in the mosque, custodian. He sent a proposal to you. And the girl says that, you know what? I've, many proposals have come to me. And I only ask for one thing in return, that I have no problem marrying any, a, anyone. But the only thing that they have to do is before they marry me, they must perform Salatul Layl for 40 consecutive days. If anyone can do this, I'll marry that person. So it said that the king went back, told the boy, told the mom, that my, my daughter says, if you can perform Salatul Layl sincerely for 40 days, then no problem, you can have our daughter. He says, okay, this is great. This is a great possibility. And anyone who's ever tried to do an amal for 40 days knows exactly how difficult it is. For example, you can perform that amal for 30 days a month of Ramadan. You can perform it for the 10 days after or the 10 days before. The 39th day, you don't wake up. Or the 39th day, you get sick. It happens to everybody. Which is why when the, when the, when the hadith states that the one who performs a certain amal for 40 consecutive days, there is, th th that thing remains in his heart forever. And that is a testimony on the Day of Judgment that he is sincere to that particular cause. For example, Dua al-Ahad, Ziyarat, Ashura, Salatul Layl, so many different things. The boy says, this is so awesome. I can marry her. All I have to do is wake up in the middle of the night, perform Salatul Layl, good for me. It says that that boy, every single night, he was, so, he was so much in love with this girl, he made the effort. 10 days, 20 days, 30 days. The mom comes and says, you know, it's been 30 days. 10 more days and that's it. We're going to send the proposal, we're going to get married, we're going to have this great festivity. He says, yes, 10 days. But he said, don't bother me. He said, because I'm actually enjoying this Salatul Layl as well. Mom says, good. It says that 40 days passed, 41 day passed, 42 days passed, 43 days passed. The mom is saying that, how come the son didn't come and tell me? She said, let me leave him. Let me wait a couple of more days, you know. Maybe he's shy to tell me. It said that 50 days passed, 60 days passed, three months passed. And the mom went to the son and said, you know, you were supposed to pray for 40 days. We're supposed to go take the proposal. Don't you want to go take the proposal for the girl? He says, what girl? What are you talking about? He says, you know, the girl, the, king, the daughter of the, of the king, don't you want to marry her? He says, marry who? He says, I'm in love already. I'm in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't need any girl. I don't need any marriage. I've found everything that I need in this Salatul Layl. And it said that the mother went to the king and, and said, said, go and tell your daughter, look, look what he's done to my son. He's become crazy. And the, and, 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 and the daughter says that this is the person I want to marry. That if someone convicts himself, someone pushes himself to performing Salatul Layl, he can reach the greatest of heights. He can reach the greatest of, of, of proximities toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when the tradition states, that the, that the noble people of my community are the ones who are protectors of the Qur'an and the ones who perform Salatul Layl. The tradition states that in, the par in, that in paradise, there will be little communities, there will be cities, there will be governments that take place. The leaders of these cities, the mayors, the governors, the presidents, I don't know what, 
The prime ministers, they will be the ones who are either the ones who are, who are close to the Holy Quran, and secondly, the ones who perform Salatul Layl every night. Then inshallah, yes, we'll all get into paradise. In fact, there's a hadith, just to go onto a quick tangent, and I tend to do that a lot, I noticed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a man came to Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alam. And he said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make dua for me that I get into paradise. He says, no, I won't do that. He says, why? He says, you're my master, you're my imam. He says, walayatuna hiya al-jannah. He says that the one who has our wilaya, he's already in paradise. So inshallah, we'll be raised with Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima al Zahra. But when we go to paradise, there are different levels of the people of paradise. The greatest of these people are the ones who are close to the Holy Quran. And after that are the ones who perform Salatul Layl. And in this month of Ramadan, we have the potential to do both of those things. So when we want to come forth to pray Salatul Layl, the question comes about, you know, how do we perform Salatul Layl? But Salatul Layl, Namaz al Shab is so difficult. And of course, these are two of the same thing for those of you who don't know. Salatul Layl is Namaz al Shab. Namaz al Shab, Salatul Layl, just in Persian language, Urdu language. That you find that some people, when they come forth, they see this task as extremely heavy. They say, How am I going to perform Salatul Layl? Who wakes, who really wakes up in the middle of the night and makes the prayers? How long does it take? Two hours? No. It takes 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Salatul Layl is 11 rakats. 11 cycles of prayer. The first eight of these, these are, the first eight cycles are performed in two. From two, 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 that makes it eight rakah of prayers in twos, like Salat al Fajr. You recite Surah al Fatiha, you recite Surah al Ikhlas, you make ruku, you make sujood, two rakahs, no problem. You do it four times, that makes it eight rakah of prayers. The next two rakah is called Salat al Shef. Wal Fajri walayal in Ashr. That we perform the first eight, we make it with the intention that we are performing the mustahab prayers of the night time. Nawafil al-layl, nafil al-layl. The next two, again we perform it just like Salat al-Fajr, with the intention Salat al-Shaf'i. The last rak'ah, that makes it ten rak'ah, no? The last rak'ah is called Salat al-Witr, meaning the one, the odd, the individual, the specific, the unique prayer, which is called Salat al-Witr. All you have to do is perform one rakah of prayer, you, you pray, you recite Surah Al-Fatah, you recite Surah Al-Ikhlas, you go into Ruku, you go into Sujood. This is the bare minimum you can do. But you go ahead and you see that the way of the Ahl al-Bayt performed Salat al-Layl. You would see that they would perform those eight rakat, they would perform the two Salat al-Shaf. And in Salat al-Witr, there is something very unique. There is what is known as the Qunut of Salat al-Witr. What's recommended is you pray, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, you recite three times Surah Al-Ikhlas, you recite Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas, and then you raise your hands to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And you ask for anything in that Qunut, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will grant it to you. This is a guarantee from the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt that if someone wants this world, then let them pray for it in Salat layl One time a man came to a, to a certain marja, and he's you know, on, the, on the night of Laylat Al-Qadr, and he said, He said, tonight is the night of Qadr, what should I pray for? Sometimes in the month of Ramadan, we ask, what do we make du'a for? He says, what should I pray for in the night of Qadr? He says, on the night of Qadr, or any time you make du'a specifically in this month of Ramadan, utlub dunya wal akhara, ask for everything in this life and the next life. So when you go and make that qunut to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you ask for anything possible. But amongst the recommended supplications is that you go out and first you begin by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness. Say, astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubu ilayh. Then you go ahead and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of the mu'mineen wal mu'minat wal muslimin wal muslimat, those who are living, those who are dead, and, Allah, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to forgive your parents, to forgive your friends, so on. And then ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you to forgive you for your sins, and then the du'as of the Ahl al-Bayt stay, call out seven times, Hada maqamul a'idh bika min al-nar. Call out by saying, Oh Allah, I am standing before you as a place, as a, as a human being who is certain to go to the fires of hell. 
who are, who are us in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we cannot even thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that how many times a day do we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, call out to Allah that say, oh Allah, that I am the place, I am the man who should be thrown into the fires of hell, but you are Arham Rahimin. One of the du'as of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salatu wa salam, he says, Allahum salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, he says, ilahi, وَمَالِي وَمَا أَبْكِي أَبْكِي لِخُرُوجِ النَّفْسِ أَبْقِي لِظُلْمَةِ قَبْرِي أَبْقِي لِسُعَالِ مُنْكَرٍ وَنَكِيرٍ إِيَّاي He says, Oh Allah, who am I? And why should I not cry? I cry in the middle of the night because I know that my soul is going to be removed from my body. I cry, oh Allah, in the middle of the night because of what is going to happen to me in the grave. Oh Allah, I cry in the middle of the night because of the questions that Munkar and Nakir are going to ask me when I enter into the grave. The way to remove yourself from all of these difficulties is by performing this small prayer known as Salatul Layl. Which is why you will go ahead and you'll find that if you go ahead and you examine the lives of each and every one of the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, each and every one of them stressed the importance of Salatul Layl. Rasulullah tells Ali ibn Abi Talib four times in one tradition, four times. When the, when the Holy Prophet says something two times, it holds a valuable importance, especially if he says them back to back. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, فَإِنَّمَا الْأُسْرَ يُسْرَ إِنَّمَا الْأُسْرَ يُسْرَ that surely after every difficulty there is ease, definitely after every difficulty there is ease. Why does God repeat it two times in a row saying the same exact words? Because he's putting a certain emphasis on that. Rasulullah, he tells Amir al-Mu'mineen, Alayka bi salat al-layl, Alayka bi salat al-layl, Alayka bi salat al-layl, Alayka bi salat al-layl. Make sure you perform the prayer. Make sure you perform it, make sure you perform it, make sure you perform it. Each and every one of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt would be standing up in the middle of the night calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever it was. We, like, like we said, Rasulullah, every night until his, until, his toes would be, until his toes would be bruised, we find Ali ibn Abi Talib until he passes out. Fatima al-Zahra would spend from the beginning of the night until the end of the night calling out to Allah, praying for everyone, even, even if it meant forgetting her own self. We find Imam al-Hassan alayhi salatu was salam on the night of Ashura, Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam, he sends Abu al Fadl al Abbas. He, he says, Go toward Amr bin Saad. Tell him to give me one more night. Why? Because I love to recite the Quran. And surely God knows that I love to pray. If you go ahead and you examine the history surrounding the maqatil of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, what do you find? that the day of Ashura was actually supposed to be the day of Tasu'ah. The ninth of Muharram was supposed to be the day in which Imam Hussein and his family were to be martyred. But Imam Hussein said, he made a request that give us one more night. It was supposed to take place in the night of battle. In fact, it, it, instead it took place on the 10th during the morning till the afternoon as we know. He said, go and tell Umar ibn Saad, he sent Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, and tell him that we want one night to pray. What were they doing? They were calling out in their qunut, ilahi al-afu, ilahi al-afu, ilahi al-afu. In fact, the tradition states from the historian that the, the camp of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salatu was salam, if you were to walk by it on that night of Ashura, you would find them people buzzing like bees. They would all be calling out and weeping and grieving in that middle of the night, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You find that on the night of the 11th of Muharram, or sorry, on the day of the 10th of Ashura, the day of Ashura, Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam, after all of his companions had been martyred, after all of his family had been martyred, he goes back into the tent one last time. He goes back and he begins to send them their last farewells, all of his family members. Then Imam al Hussein goes to Sayyid Zainab alayhi salam and says, Oh, my sister Zainab, if you've stood up, if you remember to wake up and perform Salat al-Layl, then don't forget your brother Aba Abdullah. And it is stated that on the night of the 11th of Muharram, after the caravan, after the, after the army of Amr bin Saad came forth and they lit all of the tents on fire, there was one light in the midst of all of that tent. 
That was Lady Zainab alayhi salam. She was sitting down and performing Salatul Layl because her back was broken on that day. The difficulties were so much on that day. It is said that she was sitting down and calling out, Rabbana, taqabbal minna, inna ka anta sami'u dua. Oh Allah, accept this sacrifice from the household of Rasulullah. It is said that in the middle of the prayers, Umm Kulthum came toward Lady Zainab and said, Oh Sayyidah Zainab, oh my sister, that we've gathered together all of the kids and now they're